Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Confabulating. It's our great pleasure to be joined this evening by Professor Clifford Ando of the University of Chicago, who will be speaking on the subject of law and government in the Roman world. Professor Ando is the David B. and Clara E. Stern Distinguished Service Professor and Professor of Classics, History and the College at the University of Chicago. He's the Chair of the Department of Classics and, in addition to the Department of History, is also a member of the Department of Renaissance Studies and Institutes of the Formation of Knowledge. He's held previous positions at the University of South Carolina, the University of Southern California, and at York University. He earned his PhD from the University of Michigan, and prior to that, completed his BA in Classics at Princeton University, where he graduated summa cum laude. <laughs> Professor Clifford edits and co-edits a number of publications, including Empire and After, Bryn Mawr Classical Review, No, a Journal on the Formation of Knowledge, Oxford University Press's History and Theory of International Law and Classical Philology. He's written a great many books and articles from 1994 to 2022 on topics such as local citizenship and civic participation in Western provinces, performing justice in Republican empire, sovereignty and control in ancient countryside, Roman and local citizenship, and religious affiliation and political belonging. His first book centered on the history of political culture in the provinces of the Roman empire, and he continues to write and advise on topics related to provincial administration, the relationship between imperial power and local cultural change, and the form and structure of ancient empires. He's also the general editor of the website Roman Statutes, Renewing Roman Law, a collaborative project providing a new edition, translation, and commentary of epigraphical Roman laws online. His key research interests include religion, law, and government in the Roman world, empire studies, and legal history. Professor Ando, it's fantastic to have you with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. No, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. Fantastic. So I think we'll begin tonight's discussion with perhaps just a broad introduction to your work on this particular topic. Um, what would you say kind of got you interested in this particular area in the first place? And what angles do you think, um, and what angles are you particularly keen to explore in the work that you do? Yeah, um... I can give you kind of two answers to the first question, one of which is something like biographical, and one has to do with the field. Um, and uh, uh, up to a point, you know, they converge. Um, mm -hmm. um, one is that uh, in my, I mean, as it, you know, lots of people when they, at least at some point in their lives when they narrate, uh, when they tell a story about how they came to do certain projects, they think of it as something like a, a path of individual discovery. And I'm sure it's the case in everything I'm going to say that um, uh, that the choices I made were actually, you know, heavily conditioned, if not overdetermined by the kinds of things the field was producing at the time. Um, so my... My first book was something like a history of, um, I don't know, something like the political culture of the Roman Empire. It was an attempt, curiously enough, to explain something like stability um, by reference to something like uh, the creation through particular forms of communicative action of a kind of... Um, uh, uh, a, a broad ideology, a broad kind of explanation that the um, that people in, in different social positions in the empire could use to explain to themselves why the world looked like it did. Um, I mean, I, I, I suppose as a theoretical matter, it was a kind of a piece of Marxist ideology critique. It did a great deal more than that, or at least attempted to. Um, but I'd have to say, right, if you in thinking about its broad chronological structure, it was something like a history of the post-conquest period of the empire. Never clearly states that this is what it's doing. Um, and it doesn't generally take up the question, for example, neither of the of conquest nor of the kind of, nor of the way in which at least certain contexts in the ancient world, Roman violence and the success of Roman violence must have kind of shattered the legitimacy of pre-existing social forms. 
Um, the fact that the people who had been in authority in a place were either killed or shown to be powerless has certain kinds of effects. And the book doesn't have anything to say about that. It just begins at a later moment. And um, as a also given its theoretical inclinations, it broadly insists that what it that the that its explanandum, the kind of this aspect of the shape of the empire is is a product of I don't know culture or idi or 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 you know ideology or something like this. Um, it doesn't have a lot of say about the state's administrative apparatus except in one crucial moment. Um, and it doesn't have a lot to say about, as it were, law as a system of normativity um, and so on. And there came some moment in the aftermath um, uh, in which I was, on the one hand, trying to step aside from this kind of work and write a, write a book, which turned into more than one book about religion. Um, there came some moment where I thought, well, you know, actually, there's another story to be told here um, that has to do with something like governmental power, or broadly speaking, what you know, in a different in a different tradition that would inform the book that has to do with like Foucaultian governmentality. And to write about that, I was going to have to talk about very quite specifically those mechanisms by which the state intruded into local social orders and um, in, interfered in what we might think of as intersubjective relations and how people understood both themselves and themselves and others. And, uh, you know, that's part of a matter of law or list as the operations of legal institutions as I came to understand it. And that, that launched a project to come to grips with a wide variety of legal and administrative literatures um, and the projects that have sprung out of that have I mean, go off in all sorts of baroque directions. They don't necessarily they don't they don't all have to relate to, as it were, this other way of writing a history of something like um, of government. Um, but that that's where it began. And in each and then I, I would just simply step back and say in each of these cases, um, I think um, the the work that I was doing, has an affinity, obviously, to other, other historical literatures as a comparative matter, and up to a point, an affinity with other things going on in, in strictly Greek and Roman ancient history. Um, uh, as, as regards law, of course, you know, they're starting, you know, 40-something years ago, there was a kind of significant turn towards the study of law in law and humanities projects. Um, legal history became a kind of booming enterprise in the United States. And in, <clears throat> in a variety of ways, I could, I could actually situate my work in relation to these literatures and other fields of historical study. And I'll simply observe, as often happens, that um, <laughs> many of these trends come to ancient history late. Um, so whereas, um, whereas I, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm one of the earlier people doing the form of legal scholarship I'm now doing, in Roman studies, um, I'd have to say that um, uh, many other fields of history got there first. As is so often the case. Yeah. Thank you. That's a really interesting overview. Um, I understand that you've done a lot of work um, with the provinces of Rome. Yeah. And I was sort of quite interested. Um, you sort of mentioned certainly the way that the state began to impose itself onto people, the institutions yeah. began to take shape and began to form. One thing that really interests me is that, particularly in the post-conquest period, how effective was Roman law at kind of propagating itself into provinces and kind of areas further away from urban centers? Um, so, um, I have to give a kind of two-part answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Um, because the, the one, one answer to it would have to be that, um, for a variety of reasons, uh, Rome did not initially attempt to, um, to spread Roman civil law in particular, um, 
to anyone who is not a Roman citizen. Um, Roman citizens who are outside the normal jurisdiction of a Roman authority were nevertheless responsible to conduct their lives according to Roman law at the level of family law. So Roman citizens out there in some alien community were still obliged to write a Roman will if they wanted their, you know, their their property to go to whom whoever they assigned it, and they were supposed to marry according to Roman law and so forth. They were supposed to conduct um, um, something like family law and uh, and and succession according to Roman legal forms, but Roman citizens who were resident in an alien community were supposed to follow local law in matters of, for example, of contract. Um, and, um, overwhelmingly, um, Rome simply told the separate political communities of the empire that they were to continue to use their own locally generated law, um, in the aftermath of Roman conquest. And the Romans described this as a kind of principled matter, um, that on the one hand, Roman legal forms were restricted to Roman citizens. Um, so there was a kind of exclusionary principle involved. And they also cite as a kind of principle the notion that any given political community should use its own laws. Um, the first sentence of the one surviving textbook of law from antiquity, that is to say Gaius's Institutes, opens with a claim that citizens' law, what he calls use quibule, but you might call it citizens' law. Citizens' law um, is the law that each political community makes for itself. And the language that Gaius in the inst uses in the institutes there, um, the, the lexical form of the definition is repeated in a variety of different statements by Romans. It's clear that this language has a kind of... Um, uh, a, a descriptive and normative power for them. And in particular, I focus on the um, distributive pronoun each and the reflexive for itself. So there, there are other statements by Romans. The other most famous use of this language is in a is in a statement of very similar form that says each community makes has its own religion. So Rome thinks of law and Rome thinks of something like religion bracketing all the an anachronisms involved in the use of the word religion, um, Rome thinks that law and religion are things that are distributed across the landscape of the world, community by community. And um, if they have a kind of exclusionary principle that explains this, um, it, you'd have to say it's also at some level a an expression of um, uh weak state infrastructural power. I mean, even if the Romans had aspired to make everyone live according to Roman law, how would they have taught them? What was the mechanism by which they would spread it or teach it or enforce it? And then finally, I'd have to say as regards empire as a kind of form, um, that there are lots of reasons why, you know, if, if, if Rome's primary interest in ruling was um, something like, uh, let's say, at a minimum extraction, that communities should be peaceable and pay their taxes, there was no particular utility to Rome to creating disruption and disorder by forcing people to reorganize contract, marriage, birth registrations, God knows what, um, uh, if if allowing people to conduct their lives according to laws that they felt legitimate because they were locally generated, why not do so? Um, so that's one answer. The, the first answer is that as a principled matter, Rome didn't try to spread Roman law. Um, in many cases, there did come a moment, um, however, when two things happened. I mean, there, there came a moment where Rome began um, elevating whole political communities to certain kind of status in Roman law. And the transformation since, right, if you, you it follows as a logical matter from their statement, each political community has its own law. 
that if you change the status of the community as a public law matter, if you change it from an alien community, literally anything other than Roman, right? If you change it from a non-Roman community to the two classifications in Rome would essentially have been um, a municipium, a municipality, um, or uh, uh, a Roman colony, then the the legal status of the persons in there changes as a as a necessary matter, as an entailment, and so does the law that they're supposed to follow. And we do then see, um, this is you know long after the conquest period, so it's not connected with conquest that as what the Romans regarded as an honor, they would elevate some communities um, to a state of, to a different status within Roman public law. And this had consequences for the law they used. Um, and we know something. Um, you might say we know a surprising amount, also at the same time, less than you might like, <laughs> about, about the uh, spread of Roman legal forms that followed upon this sort of thing. Um, there's a, you mentioned in your in, in your very kind introduction that I'm part of a group that's trying to produce a new edition in translation of, of those Roman laws for which we have an ancient copy. And the Romans largely insisted that um, uh, laws should be inscribed on bronze, not on stone. They were, they, they, they demanded the use of a distinctive medium for the publication of, of statutes. Um, and we have a number of these. Um, and these documents themselves make reference to other more ephemeral documents that advertise certain kinds of, like the availability of certain legal actions. So in a way, you might say that what we have is, um, what we have many copies of are something like municipal charters, frag not many, many copies of it, but fragments that show that in town A, B, C, and D, scattered around the Roman world, everywhere from the southern tip of Spain straight up through modern day, you know, Bulgaria, um, that there were towns that were incorporated as Roman municipalities and were then given a town charter in many, many sheets of bronze. And that was, you might say, a document of public law. It was a municipal charter. And those documents make reference to material on more ephemeral media, um, usually painted wooden boards that advertise or advertised or made known um, aspects of private law. Um, unsurprisingly, the things on ephemeral media don't survive. And it, it, it is also a, a really interesting feature, I mean, interesting to me and I think to certain kinds of historians that the um, um, there was such a kind of remarkable array of different media by which, you know, even official communication took place in the Roman world. You know, everything from bronze sheets to stone to tablets to white boards that were painted white to boards that you carved out a ditch in and put wax in and scratched in the wax and on and on and on and on. And a, and a really a startling number of these things that sound, you know, deeply, well, we, we might say deeply insecure, subject to vandalism, subject to simple erosion and so on. An amazing number of these things were, were in use for incredibly important documents. See that. So um, <clears throat> that's really very fascinating. Mm. Um, especially as you say, like when sort of public proclamations went up and you'd have these sort of temporary things came up that I imagine would have been very easy to kind of man sort of vandalize or dismantle mm. or tamper with in significant ways. I mean, do we have any sort of evidence of that happening at all? Yes. Um <clears throat> so what kind of Evidence do we have? So I, I was about to add, I was about to, I mean, I was while you were talking, I was thinking to myself, what one should really talk about the problem of literacy, um, you know, for as since we ourselves are, you know, come to study these documents after um, you know, long years of study of language, and because we take it's easy for us to take literacy for granted. It um uh no modern historian should take for granted what it means to say that the Romans stuck up copies of these documents in every town. Like, <laughs> um, and they, the, the, the Romans make a big deal about these things being visible. Like there, there's a standard phrase they use when publishing certain kinds of edicts, which is to say, you know, send a copy of this to every, to each city of each province, 
and tell the people in each city of each province to put the copy up in the most public space at the appropriate height so that it can be read from gr at ground level. Um, and um, there was therefore this concern for um, accessibility, if not, and, 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 and I think they, they also make reference to the kind of letters and so on. So they, they want the documents, they make a, there's a kind of performance of access. Um, you know, there, there, there must come some moment, and I could say more about this, and they, they well understood that merely sticking it up didn't mean that the law would be known. And I'll, I'll just add that, you know, there was a kind of fairly standard provision that if you um, announce a new regulation, a new law of, of any kind, the Romans tended to say something like, it has to be read aloud once a week on the market day, um, three times. So on three successive market days, before you can hold anyone liable for it, which was the, the major concession they made to the fact that in a world of low literacy, you couldn't just stick up a document and expect everyone to conform. Um, I guess the, the every now and then um, we have, it's clear that, it's clear that perhaps even more than people vandalizing, although we you, we do hear of people tearing down tearing down documents in anger for one reason or another. Um, what's perhaps more interesting than that is the um, is is a kind of proliferation of certain kinds of fake documents. Um, uh, the the most the most famous kind of fake document which. You know, people may, may well know are um are martyr acts because um and uh, in order to I'll have to, I'll have to say a word to s explain what I mean by by fake um uh sometimes the whole martyr act and sometimes only a portion of the martyr act tend to look like stenographic records of conversations between the martyrs and a Roman magistrate. So, oh, I don't. It's been a while since I thought hard about these things, but I, I believe. Look, if you look at the the martyrdom of Paeonius, um, a, a bishop in Smyrna in the third century CE, um, there's a kind of narrative portion that talks about the town and this and that, and the other thing. But then he, you know, there's a confrontation, and then he's brought before a governor, and um, the the conversation then the 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 kind of narrative style of the overall document is very much reduced for a couple of. For, for that exchange to something like a stenographic record, you know, um, uh, you know, Cliff said, Peter said, Cliff said, Peter said, Cliff said, Peter said, and then it emerges again. And um, this, the, at, at these moments in these kind of more literary texts, and in some cases, the, the entire Martyr Act is really an attempt to mimic the kind the, the form of the stenographic record that Rome produced out of administrative and legal hearings. And what I've said about these in the past um, is that you know this is a sign of their conceding the Christians, even you might even say, even the Christians, who are after all in a moment of um, conflict with the Roman state. Um, even the Christians are conceding something to the legitimacy or to the widespread acceptance of Roman systems for constructing memory. Um, so that, um, you know, in, even when you come to, I, I mean, as a comparative matter or just as an as a additional piece of evidence along these lines, um, In the ecclesiastical history of Eusebius, so the very first so-called church history, which contains a lot of, needless to say, a, a church history running a church history under Constantine, i.e., tells a tells the story of a great many martyrs, in, in, because of course he was writing just at the moment when Christianity became, as it were, legal, um, and he frequently says. Um, at some moment in the text, I haven't got time to cite the proof of this. You know, go look at the records of the province. Go look at the governor's archive, right? So that um, the when Christians, in a moment of triumph under Constantine, want to explain the history of themselves as a as a as a community, 
Um, that history is continuously validated by reference to Roman state archives. And the production of these, the, the writing of the story of the life history of Christians um, through the, the genre of the trial record was a, a, a nod to, as it were, the form of memory that, that Rome produced, as it were. As a related matter, I might say, and here's a moment when somebody could have vandalized something and they didn't. So in the aftermath of the destruction of the temple and the end of the Jewish war, um, the Jewish, you could think of it as the Neronian Jewish war, except it ends under Titus and Vespasian. Um, the Titus, the emperor of Vespasian's son is, the, is left there to kind of perform the final cleanup because Vespasian has to take off and become emperor. Um, and Titus takes his time leaving the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, he wants to go around and show people in a concrete way that Rome has won um, by way of affirming to everyone that Rome remains in charge and perhaps to demonstrate to the, to demonstrate to the pockets of Jews that are spread in other towns that this is the end. Um, so uh, he, as if he were holding like a Roman style triumph, Titus does a kind of mini tour of the East with a whole bunch of Jewish captives marching along. And he enters towns like a kind of mini victory parade in each one before he finally, of course, has a very famous and very large victory parade triumph at Rome. And um, we know from a variety of different kinds of evidence that over many years, the Jews had petitioned community by community. There, there was never any blanket claim like this. Community by community, the, the, the Jews, the minority Jewish populations in these towns in the East had petitioned for the right to um, continue to observe their own norms. Um, if you go back to what I said earlier, if, if, if a basic Roman theory was each city makes its own law and each city has its own religion, there's nothing in that kind of normative scheme to help there's, to, there's, there's no place in that normative scheme for a minority population that has its own religion. Um, so the, the, Jews, the Jews had to knock on the door of the Roman governor in each instance. And so um, we're told that, I think it's when Titus is in Antioch, and after he's held his little parade, he sits up on a some sort of platform, and the, the local town, you know, um, the local town officials thank him and say, oh, how wonderful you're visiting us, Titus, and blah, blah, blah. And yes, it's terrible that you had to fight so hard to defeat those terrible Jews. By the way, um, over there on the following building in the town square, there's a bronze plaque. Of course, it's bronze because it's a Roman law. There's a bronze plaque um, that uh, records the privileges of the Jews. Can we take that down now? <laughs> because he's he's just displayed Rome Rome as it were Rome's anger with the Jews. They were an errant population that revolted, and uh, these people seemed to th they were hopeful. Um, and uh, Titus said no. <laughs> but um, but they're, they're aware that that's a kind of moment where they're not only are they aware of the content, but it's um the public display is meaningful, uh, and they want it. They you know it remains as it were valid and operative so long as you see it. Mm -hmm. I see. I see. <clears throat> Certainly interesting stuff. And I think we've touched on a really fascinating intersection mm -hmm. between the role of law and um, the place of religion. And I'd mm -hmm. like to invite um, Nuno to continue the discussion on that a bit further. Good night, Professor Clifford. Uh, Professor, you were talking about Constantine. Uh, and we all know Constantine was the, the emperor who introduced... Uh, religion or Christianity as the official uh, religion of the of the empire so my my question here is how much did uh, Roman law shape uh, Catholic Church and how much did Catholic Church shape Roman law into the Middle Ages since Europe <laughs> did come, to Roman laws, at, at uh, least in Portugal, we use yeah. the the Roman laws. Uh, that's a not a 
not a small question. Um, hmm. Let me, um, I'll give you a, uh, uh, I'll give you a short emphatic reply um, and suggest directions we might take it if you want to. Um, the sh short answer is that in the, for the first quarter of a millennium after Constantine, for quite a long time, um, uh, Roman government had an enormous influence. In fact, even starting before Constantine, something like Roman government had an enormous influence on how the Christian church developed qua institution. Um, uh, and on the kind of evolving social position and forms of authority exercised by Christian bishops, insofar as they became important figures in, you know, local civic communities. Um, the influence of Christianity on Roman law is um, close to non-existent for the first 250 years or so. That does change, but it largely changes not because of Christian, in Christian influence on Roman law, but um, um, uh, because, uh, uh, out of the develop, but rather out of the development of a kind of, uh, of, a, of a, a separate a separate body of law altogether. Um, Roman law re was remarkably impervious. So if you look at um, you know if you if you look at these very distinctive and different codifications of law that were produced in late antiquity, the Theodosian Code, um, uh, circa four thirty eight, and then the codification of law under. Justinian um, in Constantinople um, in the middle of the sixth century. Um, So-called Christian content is, is, is very much siloed in specific chapters. It's not a pervasive influence. Um, and the, the, the legislation that is very specifically religious often focuses on essentially um, uh, the outlawing of heresy. There's not a specific body of Christian law about marriage. They certainly had no interest in changing law of slavery and so on. It 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 was um it for the first quarter millennium after Constantine, it's really quite remarkable, I would have thought, um, how little effect it had on something. That there are clearly now I'm saying now, now my answer is running longer, but I, I will say that there were some areas of dissent. And by dissent, I mean that we occasionally have records of um, discussions outside of statal spaces in, in which communities express some, some hesitation about the persistence of Roman norms that were at odd with what they took to be the demands of, of faith. Um, there's a, 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 a colleague and a friend of mine, uh, Amit Gvaryahu, has written a, a, a very interesting paper on uh, on usury, on the charging of interest, where Roman law allowed the charging of interest up to a certain figure. And, uh, uh, and of course, at some level, um, both Jewish and Christian law denied the validity of this. And ultimately, inside the Roman Empire, um, Christianity bent. Um, and the, all the various church communities of the empire eventually said, no, no, well, I guess Roman interest is okay. Um, interest at Roman levels is, is okay. But sometimes not happily. It, is, it does look like that in certain kinds of religious communities um, that there was open discussion of whether this was a great idea. And um, it's also true, I, I, if my memory of this paper is correct, I think Amit, Amit shows that in the um, in the in in the in the um, Syriac Church on the other side of the border in Sasanian Iran, um, they they stared at their brethren in the Syriac Church of 
in, in Rome and they stared across the border and said, why are you guys doing that? Right. You know, it's perfectly clear that Christianity demands that um, interest charging interest should be should not happen. Why are you why are you bending the rules of faith to uh, to accommodate the Romans? But that's the record. Um, overwhelmingly, the record is of, on the one hand, um, Christian non Christian non influence on the shape of Roman private law, and in some cases, uh, real real influence on Christian norms um, by by Rome. That's the broad pattern for a very long time. Thank you for the answer, Professor. Uh, I I want uh, I want I wanted to to ask another one. Uh, I'm if I'm afraid it's a bit longer as okay. well. I'm sorry. Um, I wanted to know if there was any differences, uh, in terms of law, or govern or uh, religion, in the West Roman Empire and in the East Roman Empire. Right. My phone keeps beeping. Let me turn that off. Um. Uh, what period are you talking about? Uh, Constantine. Constantine. So what difference is there in, specifically, could you repeat? Uh, law or religion? Because uh, I have come uh, to understanding, maybe I'm understanding wrong, but both empires are Roman, but they are kind of different. Hmm. Oh. Um. That's that's hard to say, actually. Um, so um, there are there are areas where, off the top of my head, I would say important differences emerge. Um. I mean, you know, for example, the contest over authority within the church resolves in kind of one shape in the West uh, through this effort on the part of the Bishop of Rome to claim primacy over the church, which is really, really meant only primacy in the West effectively. Um, which was, of course, contested for a very long time. Um, and now that's a case, actually, not of destruction, but that's another case of fake documents, of course, um, because most of the major most of the major turning points in this history of the Bishop of Rome trying to claim primacy have to do with falsifying documents. Um, and charmingly, they were, you know, multiple times in the history of the West. People have exposed exposed these documents as um, forged, and nevertheless, people seem to think the Pope in Rome is more important than other people. Um, and of course, now institutionally, he is. There's no point in saying he isn't. But um, but it, it's a it's a, it, it, amusing to see how that that in the in the Western Roman Empire um, throughout the late fourth and early fifth century people recognize what the pope and the bishop in rome is trying to do and they they don't accept it really at all um so one is that the contest for the central the co contest over the centralization of authority in the church look different in east and west um the 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 there is a kind of the fight that takes place in the west is about the primacy of rome and nowhere else, right? There isn't some multiple, it isn't a multipolar world. Whereas the 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 shape, the, the I don't think anyone really envisions 
authority in the church in the East ever being centralized in that fashion. It would be impossible to tell. It would be impossible to tell the, 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 the patriarch in Alexandria that he was somehow less important than the patriarch in Constantinople. Um, and of course, there's also the, 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 the very important site of Antioch. So that's a difference. Um, the, you'd have to make a kind of big abstract like claim in kind of philosophic language. Um, the kinds of things that pass for heresies in East and West strike me as different. Right. Um, the, the controversies, I mean, this is a, it, it actually is true and it fully deserves the kind of satirical mockery it receives, but the, the theological disputes that take place in the East and the Christological disputes, um, famously as people joke about, you know, that a lot of this turns on the position of a Yoda subscript and a strict Greek word is, is, is Christ of the same or merely of a similar substance to God and blah, blah, blah. That um, uh, This stuff rages on for an amazing amount of time. And um, at some level, it's just some weirdo church intelligentsia paying attention, except that we occasionally do get reports of, you know, um, well, for one thing, you know, um, the victory of one side that would then have, you know, soldiers would show up and chase some bishop out of his thing. And then, of course, um, as they sometimes debated, if it turns out that, you know, you know, Bishop Carlos in, you know, in in whatever city had been baptizing people for 20 years and he was then labeled a heretic, the all those 20 people turn out, you know, for 20 years, all the children have been baptized by a heretic and that, that has serious consequences for them, both material and effectively. Um, but the controversies that take place in the West are very different. The Donatist controversy, there's nothing, there's no, there's nothing theological or Christological about it at all. Um, up to a point, you might say the Pelagian controversy and so on, but, um, so, and, uh, um, I could well imagine if I were to continue, your, your eyes would just glaze over, but there, so there, there are, I think, real differences, both in the politics of the church and in kind of the, and in the church inflected space areas of intellectual dispute, which are also aspects because because these were real public figures who had effects on people's lives. Um, it's important to remember that a lot of these theological disputes, you know, had real material effects. This is not just like the history of philosophy or the history of ideas. Um, but um, uh, but those are the kind of areas where I think difference is really salient in the first hundred years after Constantine. Um, uh, more important differences probably start to emerge in the fifth century. But that, you know, by that time, the shape, power, and reach of government in the West is changing too. Um, so that, you know, um, it becomes I, I, the divergence in the histories of church state relations cannot be extricated as a kind of cultural matter from from the material fact of the collapse of centralized power in the West. Thank you for your answer, Professor. I just have I mean, I could, one more. I could be wrong. I, I could just have misled you terribly, but... Um... It's something, at least. <laughs> it's better than not having an answer. Yeah. As uh -huh. I have just one, one more uh, to to finish my answers. Uh, the professor talked um, a little uh, about uh, colonies, Roman right. colonies. Oh. And uh, I remembered the Greek colonies. And I want I wanted to ask if the Roman colonies had uh, something similar to the Greek colonies. For example, uh, if uh, they are, if the colonies were independent from the the metropolis. Right. Uh, yeah. Something like that. Yeah, the, uh, it's an excellent question, to which I can give a kind of formal answer, and then we could try to tease out whether the formal answer can cashes out in, into kind of um, um, 
in some cash it out in some meaningful way and as it were political or social conduct um the quick answer is yes there's a big formal difference between roman and greek colony colonies um when greek states sent out colonies um uh the new community became an autonomous city state um it was no longer politically dependent upon the metropolis. And at some level, the language of polis metropolis, that is polis and mother polis, reflects the biological metaphor um, is actually kind of real, right? That the like a mother and a child, the child is ontologically a separate thing. It may be descended from, um, but it, 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 it either immediately or soon acquires a kind of genuine, as it were, ontological separateness and material independence from its mother. Um, and in the Roman case, the Romans insisted that Roman colonies were something like substituent parts of the mm. Roman state of the Roman city state of Rome. Um, so for example, Roman colonies, did not elect what you might call higher magistrates. There was, as it were, something like a cap on the titles and powers that they accorded to the, the local magistrates in the colony because they were imagined that, you know, through some kind of weird metaphysical process, because Rome, some of these colonies were very far from Rome, but certainly the ideology and at some level the public law insisted that because they were merely parts of the city-state of Rome, they didn't need higher magistrates because they had higher magistrates. They were just way over here. Um, and as a as a kind of illustration of this, I might say that the, the term metropolis doesn't appear in Latin until incredibly late. I think it's around 200 CE. Because it, it, it the notion of a mother city that gives birth to its own city it's just not something that you need to express in Latin because it just was not true. At least that's why I claim that it appears so late in Latin. Um, is that is that the what it would what the term expresses is not something the Romans believed about their colonies. Uh, thank you for the answer. The mother and son analogy was perfect to understand <laughs> the difference, the division <laughs> between uh, both. But that, that uh, you know. It's their language, and yeah, in this case, in this case, and unless they're, you know, unless somebody discovers some stone inscription in which the term metropolis appears in Latin, like you know, two hundred years earlier, it's the sort of it, this is sort of a, you know when it, it's um, it's the sort of thing classicists are fond of doing, because we have a we have a big data set, but it's finite, and there are things you can get to know about it, and then you make these empirical claims. Aha. This was broadly true of the ancient world. And then the whole, the whole, the whole house of cards comes tumbling down because somebody finds a papyrus or an inscription, but there you go. So, but the, the Greeks called their city-states polis, yeah. right? The Romans, what did the Romans call to them, to their oh, city-states? Oh, let, let, yeah, let me, let me add one further thing, right? I mean, even in, even in a single document like the Thucydides history of the Peloponnesian War. Note, right, note how many, you could just read any big text about the history of the Greek world, and you will almost immediately encounter the story of a city going to war with one of its colonies. That, you know, like, I mean, to use the American analogy, like, like parents and children getting together for a Thanksgiving holiday, the first thing that happens is a fight breaks out. Um, and that never happens in Rome. These are not autonomous polities that have their own foreign policy. No, no. Okay. Uh, a Roman colony is not in that business. Um, uh, in general, the Romans restrict, the, the terminology is restricted to terms like kiwitas, um, which is an, an abstraction from kiwis. So a kiwitas means something like citizen body, but by a kind of metonymy, it also means the city-state. Um, uh, municipium, from which we get municipality, um, sometimes, and and those, and and colonia, colony, and colony, kiwitas, and municipium are basically the central terms 
for autonomous city state. There's then a wide variety of there's a wide variety of uh, other words, oppidum, town, forum, like marketplace, conchiliobulum, probably meaning something like gathering place. There are a couple of these things that get used, um, uh, but they're weakos, pagos, things like this. But they um, communities like that tend not to be administratively important because they will be they they will almost all, always have been um, kind of like administratively subordinated to some nearby city state, which will which will itself be called a municipium equitas or a colony. Thank you so much for all your answers. I absolutely love them all. Uh, but uh, my uh, my colleague Carlos have a que have one more question to okay. go. So thank you once okay. again, oh, Professor Clifford. Well, good afternoon, good evening, Professor. Uh, talking about the origins of the Roman law. Can we consider the 12 tables as the key points of the foundation of the law that we know today? Uh, well, huh. So that's a complicated question because, um, um, I, uh, I happen to think, um, Well, so I happen to think the twelve tables is a forgery. Okay. That it um uh it would take a long time to lay out the argument. I'm not the only person who has ever thought this. Um um you know the quick version of the a quick version of the problem is um very, very hard to believe that the Romans wrote a sophisticated large code of law in the mid fifth century BCE. Um, just doesn't, the, the timing looks wrong. Um, more importantly, um, no word of that, of the 12 tables is ever cited in any document or any text until something like I don't know, a round number would be like 80 BC. And if you if you take all extant Latin, I mean, Latin starts to survive in a meaningful way, let us say circa 200, just as a round number. And if you take all Latin from 200 to the year 101, from the first century of Latin writing, all government documents, all laws, all decrees of the Roman Senate, all political oratory, all of it together, all of that, no law before about 180, there's a one possibility of a law around 200, but let's say a law of two, no law before 200 is ever named. No word of any law is ever quoted. The 12 tables are never named. The 12, no word of the 12 tables ever appears in any of these documents. And yet we're somehow supposed to believe. So now, the Romans themselves came to say that they had originally had a code of law from the mid fifth century. And um, there are, you know, there are, I mean, it's at least possible. Um, they, you know, and they maintain that there are still a small number of legal actions in from the 12 tables that you know remain accessible to litigants um, in the classical period, maybe. Um, uh, so the, the Romans came to genuflect before the idea of themselves as a community that had always already been organized according, you know, um, operated according to law. Um, and that myth had a kind of potency and an effect in the ordering of Roman life. And in their, and up to a point, therefore, our ideology of what the rule of law looks like, um, uh, substantively, a greater influence on, I mean, if substantively a greater influence on our law, and particularly on legal thinking, 
comes from this document that the Romans called the, the Praetor's Edict, because the, 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 the organization of the Praetor's Edict um, is incredibly important for the organization of Justinian's Digest, and therefore also um, um, uh, for the organization of topics and the codes and so on. So if you were to go, uh, I mean, this is quite apart from, as it were, the actual the influence of Latin legal argument, which is also important. Obviously, the, the you know the 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 whole problems of definition and of, of of the shape of legal argument and the use of fictions. There are all sorts of smaller areas of legal thought where Roman juristic writing are are influential. But there's a further this very interesting problem that Rome, you know, out of the Praetor's Edict, however the Praetor's Edict came to be organized the way it was. Later Romans read this thing called the Praetor's Edict as have as, as in essence having constructed a, a, a kind of organizational chart. Or what are the what are the important substantive areas of life that law should regulate? And you know, contract goes here and marriage goes there and so on and so on, and property and so on. And um, um that kind of flow chart, that chart or that kind of chart that you can abstract out of this document to illustrate social life over here, law over here, and that there's this mapping of law onto social life. And then there'll turn out to be bits of life that are unregulated and so on, but they're just not named by the law. The law never says, oh, there's a thing we don't bother to regulate, right? The, a, a kind of vision of society comes out of the organization of this law uh, or out of this document. And um, that, that that mapping of law into society is incredibly long lived. I mean, you, there are ways, right? Um, I don't know if you ever looked at this, right? You know, but uh, Jean Baudin, the uh, uh, the early modern French legal theorist who who in his Republic gave us a kind of one of the earliest and most potent claims to what a, a state of strong sovereignty would look like. Before Baudin wrote the Republic, he wrote a kind of like poster. He wrote a big chart. Of, of the law. What are the areas that the law should aspire to regulate? Um, and that flow chart, I mean, it's just a poster. It was printed as a big broadsheet. Um, uh, and um, since it was complicated to print and so on, um, he then rewrote it as a little book. And having rewritten it as a book, I think he re later rewrote the whole damn thing as a, as a philosophical dialogue in which people sat here like this and said, tell me, Bodan." What should the law do? And he says, well, thank you for that question. The first thing the law should do is X. Anyway, um, but anyhow, um, that the whole notion of that flowchart and, and the shape of his art, the shape of his vision of law emerges out of this process by which jurists looked at the Praetor's Edict, not at the 12 tables, but they looked at the Praetor's Edict and extracted a kind of vision of society out of its sections. Um, uh, and I, I have to confess that one of the reasons I say that that's so terribly important is precisely because I'm not I'm, I'm not a believer in the twelve tables, and I'm I'm not alone, but I'm 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 not in a majority in in my claims about the twelve tables. So can we call it a popular misconception? Maybe. Uh, yeah. I mean, no. It, I I meant what I said earlier, which is that the Romans passionately believe that the twelve tables existed. And it allows them to make a kind of claim that they wish to make, which is that Rome has always been a polity of law. And to the extent that these kind of social theoretical claims by the Romans had, you know, massive influence. So the notion that to be a meaningfully juridically constituted community, we need a law code. I mean, that, that in itself is a kind of gift of Rome to the world. Thank you oh, for your yeah. answer, Professor. It was very enlightening. Uh, pass the word to Peter. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, <clears throat> we have one final question for you today um, from Nuno regarding slavery and freedom. Oh dear, okay. <laughs> Hello once again. My last question. This is the last, I promise. Um, okay. I want to understand the concept of freedom, of how a slave could achieve freedom legally. Oh, um, huh. Uh, so 
Rome, I mean, Greek and Roman slave systems um, freed people much more commonly than um, um, than uh, modern slave systems in general. Um, certainly, everyone that I know of, and I'm I'm not a I don't work on slavery, but you know I, I have looked at comparative studies of slavery is of course a, a major and incredibly important field of research and historical study. And Greeks and Romans menu, as they put it, manumitted or freed slaves more often than modern systems. Um, with the important caveat that so-called manumission was probably not symmetrically distributed as a practice across all types of slaves and across all communities, right? So since a lot of slavery in the classical period was a product of warfare, um, you know, the, there probably were all sorts of murky areas in which formerly people were slaves, but you might well have called them POWs because they were probably ransomed quite quickly. Um, um, Roman law treated people, Roman law, as far as Rome was concerned, a Roman who was captured was immediately classified as a slave. And of course, in a certain th theoretical twist was therefore also classified as dead. Um, and then they had to develop a system of law for how to talk about such a person when they came back from captivity and resume their life. Um, um, <clears throat> so um, now, and there are various reasons to think, for instance, that urban slaves were much more likely to be manumitted than agricultural slaves, and so forth. But within this broad landscape in which manumission was much more common in antiquity than um, in modern systems of slavery, um, Rome was famous for the frequency of manumission. That is, non-Romans remark on the frequency with which Rome manumitted slaves. And it happened for a number of reasons. First, it's probably important to say that it probably was true that um, Roman slave owners um, freed broken down agricultural slaves because they didn't want to care for them anymore. And so you were happy to sell this. Congratulations, broken down old person. You're now responsible for feeding yourself and I am not. And right, So the freedom, great. Um, uh, there certainly was a discourse about slaves becoming useless. Um, it's also true um, that, um, um, and it because uh, because Roman legal writing is much more concerned with people who have money than people who are poor. Um, there's a lot of Roman legal writing about relations between owners and slaves, and owners and freed slaves, freed freed persons, because. Slaves and freed persons were allowed to do quite perform quite specific economic and legal actions on behalf of either their owner or what they came to call their patron. Um, and broadly speaking, you might say that slaves, but also freed persons, um, 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 helped the Romans. It was one of the mechanisms the Romans used to solve what we might call a, a principal agent problem. Um, that there's a lot of economic contract law, which looks in a way, oddly primitive, it was hard for one free person to employ another free person to act as his agent in economic relations. But your slave, and in particular, your freed slave, could do such things for you that other free people could not. And that sets up a kind of very interesting... There's a very, very, very interesting book just about to come out on this. Um, um, uh, 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 and... Um, Anyhow, so the, the, the manumission of slaves was quite common. Um, that it's very hard to know the numbers, um, except that um, you know, I, well, I could cite you weird points of data, like how what percentage of tombstones in a particular area explicitly say, you know, this is the tombstone of Cliff or Peter or Carlos, who's comma freed person, and they would often then say Cliff freed person of Peter. Um, so they flag that relationship. Um, the problem, and the problem is that many other things are unknowable, right? Um, 
you you know, uh, uh, are there freed slaves who didn't put their freed status on their tombstone? Um, were were freed persons more likely, less likely, or the same level likely to participate in quote unquote epigraphic culture and put up a stone monument for themselves and so on? So that there, there are some very sophisticated studies, or there, there there are a lot of studies that attempt to get at the question really. How many, you know, how much did the did the Romans free free their slaves? And it looks like a lot. It looks like a lot, um, but but it's a difficult science. There's a fair degree of um, irresolvable uncertainty. Um, you know, that a, a possible number is that twenty percent of certain urban urban populations, twenty percent of certain ur urban populations were freed slaves. So there were a lot of slaves, and there were also a lot of freed slaves. Um, in some urban areas of Italy. Thank you for your answer, Professor. I will pass it to my colleague, Peter. Thank you once again. Sure. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, I'm afraid that brings us to the end of our discussion today. Yeah. Real pity is there are so many other kind of areas that we could explore and look into, but I'm afraid um, that's our time for today. Um, so I'd therefore like to thank Professor Ando very much for joining us this evening. Thank you very much for everybody thank who's you. watching. Thank you all very I hope you join us in the next episode. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Bye, guys.